Welcome everyone to our Good Friday Reflection. We are so glad to have you with us, whether you're from Bury St. Edmunds or the surrounding villages, or from much further afield. Thank you so much for joining us for our time together online today. My name is Graeme Jack. I'm part of the staff team at West Road and Wesley Community Church, where I'm responsible for leading Wesley Community Church and also for all of our community work outside the church and the congregation's doors. Those of us who live locally on Good Friday would normally be participating in a united act of worship as a united church in town, which would normally involve gathering at the cathedral for a service and then processing from the cathedral up into the butter market uh, as an act of a witness together. Because the virus, we're not able to do that today. So we did thought that we would just leave you an online reflection to guide our response to the God who came and gave it all for us and ultimately paid the ultimate price for our sin in dying for us this day. So this online service this morning is specifically for Good Friday and to guide our hearts as we reflect on all that Jesus went through in leaving his home and in dying for us. In the service this morning, Hannah Morgan is going to lead us in some worship and we're going to have some testimony from Ian. Ian Featherstone is one of our newer uh, Christians and he's going to share very simply what Easter means to him and his life today. And then we're going to be guided from the Bible in a reflection by Victor Jack, who's going to help us all just remember what Jesus has done for us and respond to Jesus in our hearts and our lives today. So before any of that, should we just take a moment and pray together and then we're going to have some worship with Hannah. Father, thank you for our time together today, a time to pause and to remember your love for us in sending Jesus to be our saviour, a time to remember all that Jesus gave up, including his life, so that we can receive your grace, your forgiveness, eternal life and friendship with you forever. We invite you to come, Holy Spirit, and to make our remembrance this day real and personal to each one of us. Would you remind us of the Father's love for us, of the Son's sacrifice, and would you equip us by your Spirit to respond in worship today and through offering our lives back to you. We ask all this in and for your name and for your glory's sake.
Hi, I'm Ian Featherstone and I would like to share with you a short testimony of what Easter means to me. So I've only actually been a Christian for a couple of years now, so I've experienced many an Easter as a non-believer. So for me, Easter used to mean a couple of extra days off work and an egg hunt with the children. But since becoming a Christian, Easter has took on a very different meaning. I was actually very blessed that I was baptised on Easter Sunday two years ago in 2018. Now baptism is a confession of faith. It basically says, I belong to Jesus and I want to show the whole world that I belong to him. But a baptism is also symbolic. Today is Good Friday, the day that Jesus died on the cross and was buried in Joseph's tomb. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, defeating the sting of death. When I stepped into the water at West Road Church two years ago on that Easter Sunday, I shared in the death of Jesus Christ. When I went under the water, I shared in his burial in Joseph's tomb. And when I came up out of the water, I shared in his resurrection, and I was born again into the family of God, changing my life forever. So what does Easter mean for me now? Romans 8 verse 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So for me, Easter means freedom. It means freedom from condemnation, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, and freedom from the yoke of slavery. But the punishment that brought me peace was upon him. It was by his wounds that I was healed. Happy Easter. I say I believe
Welcome everyone to this uh, meditation on the first Good Friday. It's lovely to be speaking to you from the sunshine on this beautiful day. And here's an extract from Luke's Gospel, just a little snapshot of what happened on that first Good Friday. And I'm reading from Luke chapter 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting just what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. The deep silence in which Jesus suffered as he hung on the cross must have been in stark contrast to the noise and the hubbub of the crowd as they passed by. Crucifixions invariably took place on public holidays so that the maximum number of people could come and stand and stare and mock those that were the victims. Yet the voice of Jesus was heard amidst all the raucous behaviour that took place. Jesus spoke seven times from the cross and the echo of those sayings is still with us 2,000 years today and though each spoken word is only a fragment of what must have passed through Jesus mind it gives us an insight a window into his soul so that we have some idea of what he was thinking and how he was feeling as he died on the cross the very first words that Jesus uttered are absolutely amazing when you think of all the pain and suffering and rejection that he was experiencing. Father, he said, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And we're going to reflect on what Jesus prayed, when Jesus prayed, and why Jesus prayed. First of all, when Jesus prayed, because the timing of his prayer adds wonder to the significance of it. Then Jesus prayed. It was uttered not just after he'd been roughly arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, nor when he had been unjustly tried in Pilate's judgment hall, not just after he'd been flugged by the Roman soldiers who used that terrible thong in which were often woven pieces of bone and metal that could reduce a man's back to pulp, not just after he had been crowned with thorns which were some three inches long, not just after he'd been carrying the crossbeam on his bruised and bleeding back, but after ugly Roman spikes had been driven through his hands and feet, and the cross had been lifted up on high and dropped in its socket with a shuddering jolt on his body. It was then, in the wake of all that, that Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, when all the evil and hatred and hostility that's locked in the heart of man was actually vented on him. What a dark, dark moment in human history. And yet when men had done their worst, the love of Jesus was seen at its best. Someone has recorded, never has such mercy confronted such meanness. Never has such kindness confronted such cruelty. Never has such love confronted such hatred 
and never has such forgiveness confronted such injustice. And Jesus prayed that prayer when scripture was being fulfilled. This ugly and shameful scene was prophesied by Isaiah some 600 years before when he wrote, under the inspiration of the Spirit, he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What an amazing picture. The Son of God, the King of Kings, hanging between two common criminals, facing the mockery of ignorant men, enduring the agony of the crucifixion, bearing our sins in his innocent body. And yet in the midst of all that, he is praying for those who were putting him to death. And it was also when Jesus was betraying in his life a truth he had earlier taught with his lips. From the Sermon on the Mount some three years earlier, Jesus had said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and pray for those that persecute you. Jesus was doing what we find so hard to do. He was practicing what he'd been previously preaching. We all know in principle how we should respond when we're hurt and when we're humiliated. But often we react with anger, bitterness, and even in a spirit of revenge. And then we come to what Jesus actually prayed. Father, forgive them. Though he was on the cross, the world was on his heart. Forgive them, he cried. It was a cry for mercy, not for judgment. And yet what generous words they were on the lips of Jesus. And this prayer has no parallel in human history. To think that the Prince of Life could pray for those who were putting him to death. To think that he could look to God and ask for him to act in mercy rather than in judgment. One of the striking things to me about this whole scene is the dignity of Jesus in the midst of his suffering. Because if you read the narrative carefully, you will not find any word of complaint, no sense of righteous indignation, no cry for God to act in judgment, ever escaped his lips, only a prayer for forgiveness. Throughout it all, he remained silent and dignified. And Isaiah again prophesied this scene when he wrote, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and before his shearers he was silent, so he did not open his mouth. The poet has written, That day when Jesus stood alone, and felt the hearts of men like stone, and knew he came but to atone, that day he held his peace. They bound him with a cruel cord, they witnessed falsely to his word, and mockingly proclaimed him Lord. But Jesus held his peace. They spat upon him in the face. They heaped upon him all disgrace. They dragged him on from place to place. But Jesus held his peace. My friend, have you for far much less, with rage which you called righteousness, resented slights with great distress, your Saviour held his peace. And then we're told why Jesus prayed that prayer for they do not know what they are doing. How could it be said they didn't know what they were doing? That may have been true of the Roman soldiers who were just carrying out another execution. It was a common task for them. But what about the Jewish leaders who knew the Old Testament scriptures that prophesied of the time when the Messiah would come and the sufferings that would follow? And they had seen him in action and they had to declare that God was with him. They heard his words and said, no one is speaking like this man. All that Jesus was, all that he said, and all that he did proclaimed him to be the Son of God, and yet they hounded him to death by crucifixion. And yet what a generous prayer this is on the lips of Jesus, because he knew that those who were murdering him didn't really understand who he was. They didn't fully know what the point and purpose of his sacrifice was. And so he pleads in mercy that God would forgive them because they didn't really understand what was happening. Both Peter and Paul also recognized this. Peter, preaching in Jerusalem shortly after this event, said to the Jewish leaders, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. 
And Paul wrote later to the church in Corinth, none of the rulers understood it because if they had have done, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it's wonderful to notice that the prayer of Jesus was answered. There was an immediate response on that very day. The thief beside him, he saw in Jesus not another criminal going to his death, but a king going to his kingdom. He'd heard the prayer of Jesus, Father, forgive them. He must have wondered, would Jesus forgive me? So he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus promised him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What about ourselves? We can't stand back and say we had no part in that dark crime. It was our sin, our self-sadness, our rebellion, our unbelief that took Jesus to his cross. In ignorance, we ignored him, even blasphemed his name and refused to love and trust him. And yet we too, on this Good Friday, can receive forgiveness and peace with God if we turn to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness and if we turn from all the things that sent him to the cross. Maybe today on this Good Friday, we not only need to ask Jesus for forgiveness, but maybe some of us need to offer forgiveness to others. If we ask him to fill us with the spirit of Jesus, then he will give us the strength to do that. Some of us may be feeling today this standard is too high for us to aspire to. But one man caught the spirit of Jesus very soon after, and his name was Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He was dragged outside the walls of Jerusalem without a trial, and his body was brutally bludgeoned with rocks and stones. And yet, how did he respond? He knelt and he prayed, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And the example of Jesus praying for those who are murdering him has been the inspiration of so many people down through the ages. And I think particularly this morning of the tragedy at Inniskillen on the 14th of November, 1987. Here crowds of people had gathered at the war memorial for the annual remembrance service when suddenly a bomb planted by the IRA exploded and killed 63 people and wounded many others. It was a shattering experience for everyone involved, not just because of the destruction to human life, but also the damage that was done to individuals. Yet against, against that but dark background of evil and cruelty, there shone one bright star. George Wilson and his 20-year-old daughter Marie were buried in the falling masonry. Marie died while holding her father's hand. Her last words were, Daddy, I love you very much. It was a terrible blow for George and Marie Wilson, her parents. Yet how did he react? When he was interviewed on radio and TV television, this is what he said. My wife Joan and I do not bear any grudge. We do not hold any ill will against those responsible for this. I shall pray for those people tonight and every night. God forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What a response. In most people's eyes, it was unbelievable. It was unnatural. It was incredible. And yet the same spirit that was in Jesus was now filling, filling him. And he was able to pray, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. His message was heard by millions on TV and radio. It was a, flashed across the world. It was on the front pages of many newspapers. He was later commended in the Queen's speech. It was a ray of light and hope breaking through all the darkness and despair of that human tragedy. And so it teaches us that forgiveness is costly. We only have to look at the cross to really understand that. And it's only when somebody has wounded us deeply and we face the challenge to forgive or not to forgive, do we understand what it will cost us by way of moral courage, by way of personal effort and great humility to go and forgive somebody else, especially if they don't ask for forgiveness, or especially if we feel what they have done is so awful they don't deserve forgiveness. And people often react and say, all oh, this teaching about forgiveness is desperately unfashionable. 
We live in a world that cries out for vengeance and retribution. And yet if we don't forgive, we're dominated by the people who've hurt us because we become imprisoned in the walls of bitterness and resentment. And it's a poison that infects our souls, which can cause physical illness, psychological problems, and even nervous disorders. I like the words of Nelson Mandela when he said, forgiveness liberates the soul. How much our broken world with all its bitterness and hatred, needs to experience the healing power of God. Let the Bible have the last word. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every kind of malice, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Amen.
Well, we're so pleased you've been able to join us today for this Good Friday Reflection, and we trust that you have been so encouraged as you've been engaging in an act of worship, listened to Ian's story, and reflected with Victor's message. We trust that this will help you in your worship, help you in your response to God and all he's done for us this Easter weekend. We recognise many in this COVID-19 season are really, really under pressure. And we want to remind you that we are here as a church, uh, not just to produce services like this, but also to pray and to care. So if you would like some prayer or to access our care in these days, please email us at care at westroadchurch.org.uk or you can call the office telephone on 01284 723 737. I'm just going to wrap up our service today with prayer, trusting that God will bless you where you are at today and meet you at your need. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you so much for being a God who loved us and has demonstrated his love by coming for us. We remember again that you are the God who so loved the world that you sent your one and only Son for us. Thank you for putting our desperate need above your own life. Jesus, thank you for being the God who came to rescue us, to restore our relationship with us, and ultimately to revive our souls through the possibility of forgiveness. Thank you that forgiveness is only possible because you came and you died and you bore all of our sins and punishment on your body when you died on that wicked, wicked cross. Thank you for going through the agony, the mockery, all the rejection for us. We worship you this day and we simply come and hand our lives back over to you. It's all we have to offer you after such an amazing sacrifice for us. Would you take our hearts, our souls, our minds, all that we have this day, and would you come and live in us again? We pray again, looking forward to Easter Sunday, that you would come in all your resurrection glory and bring life to our souls and to our spirits this Easter. We long to find hope in you because we recognize true hope only exists in you. The God who rescues, the God who restores, the God who revives, and one day will take us to be with himself. So we thank you for the hope that comes screaming from history through the cross and through the resurrection. And we thank you that you have chosen us. Thank you again for being a God who comes to seek and save the lost. We worship you from the bottom of our hearts today, and we give you our thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.